Hello everyone, uh, this is me, Ahmed Al Garhi, and I will be moderating this uh, special se uh, session. Uh, today we have very special guest speaker, Dr. Ahmed Goma. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Goma, uh, now he is working for uh, BP in uh, Houston. Uh, also, before he worked for uh, Saudi Aramco and worked for a long time for uh, uh, Baker Hughes. Uh, Dr. Goma got his PhD from uh, Texas A&M University. Also, he published many conference papers and many journals, and also he holds many U.S. patents. So please, if you have any questions, you can leave it in the chat box. And, you know, uh, also at the end, we will uh, have a few minutes to ask questions. So you can keep your question to the end, or you can write it down in the chat box. Dr. Goma, uh, the mic is yours. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, thanks, Ahmed, for your nice introduction. And uh, please, for the audience, like, I know it's tough to have, like, a, a online session, online learning session. However, I usually like to be interrupted. I, I usually like to get a question during the presentation. So if you have any question, any comment, please use uh, uh, the messaging system. So you can, you can drop us a message and Dr. Ahmed will help us to, uh, to read it. And I cannot, see, I cannot see it from my side, but Dr. Ahmed can help moderating and have... Let's try to be interactive as much as we can, if we can be able to do that. Uh, so, to go through uh, the title of the presentation today, we will try to, to give like a, a quick introduction about acid stimulation. And usually I would like to start with a definition. What does acid stimulation mean? By definition, acid stimulation means it, it's a process that's unsteady state, non isothermal 3D flow, in porous media with a chemical reaction need to dissolve the rock. So, unsteady state flow. So, we are injecting and the velocity and the pressure are actually changing with time. They are not constant with time. As you are injecting, uh, both are, pores are changing in each minute as you keep injecting your acid. Non-isothermal, as the acid react with the formation, it actually sometimes reduces temperature. So, we may have temperature increase during the reaction. CD flow, 3D flow, we're not in a more linear flow, we're not in a more radial flow, we're actually much closer to a spherical flow. With the acid, depending on the ratio between the vertical to horizontal permeability, will flow in, in all the direction. And the most important, we are injecting the acid inside the formation. So we will have a porous medium flow. So we are governed by Darcy law. And as I'm talking about acidizing, we are talking about chemical reactions. So the acid will actually dissolve the rock and that will result in variation in prostium permeability. If the acid reacts with, with, with the rock and you will have dissolving some rock. So we're expecting increasing the porosity that will lead to increasing the permeability However, as any reaction happening, you will have also a reaction product. And the reaction product sometimes will be completely soluble, and then other reactions will not be soluble. So we'll have some precipitation of the reaction product. This is will also reduce the porosity and will affect the permeability. So we all the time during the acid acidizing will have both, increase the porosity and permeability, and at the same time, reducing the porosity and the permeability. Hopefully at the end of the job, we would like to be sure that we dissolve much more than what we precipitate, leading to a much higher permeability and much higher production. And that's will, at the end, our aims from any acidizing as enhancing well productivity, we'd like to be sure that the well will produce at a much better uh, rates comparing before the acidizing. Second, if we have any scale, we need to do completely sublize and dissolve this scale. The third, the skin factor, which is a more important for us. We would like to reduce the skin factor, especially in the near well bore area that coming from the damage. So this is like a quick definition of that stimulation. 
And a question is also like, as a young engineer, when you go to a company, like your manager will come to you and ask if we have a well, when we will consider an asset treatment, at what condition that you will start thinking that I need an asset treatment uh, for my well? We have only one answer for this question. You use acid treatment when you have damage. We do not use acid treatment just to increase the, the production. Acid is helped to increase the production if you have a damage. But if you do not have a damage, acid will not, will, 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 will not actually give you that much improvement of, of production, except if you are doing something else that, other than the acid part. But acidizing is always used when you have a damage. And the way that you know that you have a damage is just simple definition. You have unusual or unexpected reduction in oil production. This is can happening like as a gradual. You, you can see slightly you are losing your production, not the way that there is a foreign engineer expecting or the model that can give you. And that can give you evidence that you are building scale with time. So you have a slow reduction in the oil, in oil production, or you have suddenly lose your production. Something happened like pretty quickly. And that's happening when you block something, you block the perforation or block part of the tubing. That can happen that you lose a production suddenly. And one of the most important evidence, you are looking to the gas or ratio or the water cut. If you start seeing unexpected increase in the gas or ratio or the water cut, that's all can give you, the, give you evidence that you have some sort of damage. And when you have a damage, at that time you start to thinking that I need an acid to remove this damage. Okay, what type of acidizing stimulation we have? We, def we define the type of acidizing stimulation into two parts, the first or two types. The first type is uh, called the matrix acidizing and the second one called the fractional acidizing. And the distinguish is pretty simple. When we are talking about matrix acidizing, so in this case, we are bumping the acid at a pressure and injection rate less than fracture pressure. So in our case, we are bumping the acid inside the matrix without any intention of breaking this formation or creating a frac. Just pressure and rate low enough to just push the acid through the porous media. And what will be happen, the acid will react with the pores and the natural fracture that exists. However, it will not create additional frac. It just will dissolve the pores and improve your porosity and permeability. And for matrix acidizing, we have a two type of treatment. One, one for sandstone, depending on the formation type, one called sandstone acidizing and the other called carbonate acidizing. However, the other type of acid stimulation is called the fracture acidizing. And I believe you can guess right now, in this treatment, we are bumping at a higher pressure than the fracture pressure. We are actually breaking down the formation and create an hydraulic frac and bumping the acid that will actually stimulate this hydraulic frac and dissolve the created frac surface. We call it etching the created frac surface and this etching will create uneven uh, fracture shape, so fracture face. And as, as it closed, you can see the conductivity of the frac is significantly higher. I will have a picture later and we can show you how this is, is helping. So what type of acid we usually use in acid stimulation treatment? We have a lot of acid that we use. We can define them into different categories. The first category is the inorganic acid. And in organic acid, we have two main types of acid. We have hydrochloric acid, we call it HCl, and hydrofluoric acid and HF. Just to highlight, HCl uh, is the one that is mainly used, like a lot, majority of acidizing somehow contain the HCl. It has the capability of dissolving a lot of mineral, carbonate, oxidized, and a lot of things. The other type is the HF. And the HF acid 
is the only acid that dissolves sandstone formation. Therefore, when we are talking about sandstone formation, your mind must recover that some sort of HF acid will be present in this formulation. Then we have organic acid, we have acetic, formic, and citric. And we use organic acid in the area that we will not be able to use the inorganic acid, and mainly because of the uh, low corrosion rate. Then we have blends. And as engineers, we really like blends. We try to blend different acids to get the benefit of each one. So we have organic blend like HCLHF. We have a pure organic blend like acetic formic or acetic formic citric or citric acetic. And we also have a blend between organic and inorganic like formic HCL or formic HF or citric HF. So we do blend with all the acids. And in each, in, in each blend, we try to get the benefits of both. Then lastly, we have what we call the special acids. And we typically use this acid in a certain condition. Like we have acid like amino carboxylic acid and GLD. And typically we use this acid when the temperature is extremely high, where like almost 350 and above, like 350 Fahrenheit or 400 Fahrenheit in this case, the regular acid HCl, HF is, is a little bit hard to use them. Corrosion rate will be, will be high. So we are looking for some of the special acid at a special condition. Or when we can, HCl is for a certain regulation is not acceptable. So we can use MSA as alternate to the HCl. Any questions so far? Okay, so now you can go ahead and you know if there's any question I will stop you and ask. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's go one by one in the acid and let's learn about it. So the first acid I would like to cover the HCL acid system. It is one of the most used acid in acidizing treatment. We use it because it has a lot of good advantage. First concentration. We can use it between three to twenty-eight percent. So it is a very wide concentration we can we can use. So we can use it at really diluted condition or really concentrated uh, condition. And the most important part is dissolving power. HCl is a really high dissolving power. It actually, like 1,000 gallon of 15% HCl can dissolve 1,700 pound of formation of carbonate formation. So you can dissolve a lot of downhole. You can, you can increase significantly the porosity and significantly the permeability by having this acid. Dissolving bar is really huge. And is it cheap? Believe or not, it just cost 70 cent, I would say 0.7 dollar, a gallon. So it's a pretty cheap. So cost for us is pretty cheap. So having the highest dissolving power and cost is pretty cheap. So that's a lot of advantage of this acid. Therefore, it's a one of the acids that we typically use in the oil and gas industry. And most important part, the reaction product. When it reacts with the formation, whatever came out as a reaction product is completely water soluble. So we do not see a lot of damage due to the reaction product coming for HCl. And I have here the two reaction for two formation. The first equation, when HCl reacts with the calcium carbonate, which is the carbonate formation, you can see the reaction product is calcium chloride, which is that salt, CO2, and water. Calcium chloride is a salt and known it with high dissolving power. So it's completely soluble in water. So we don't have any precipitation issue when we are using calcium chloride. Even when the HCl reacts with the calcium magnesium carbonate, which is a dolomite formation, still we are getting calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, CO2, and H2O. Everything is soluble in water. So we do not see any precipitation or any concern from precipitation. 
with the high dissolving power with no afraid of precipitation make this acid one of the most used acid system inside the oil and gas industry before i go to the concerned part i may would like to have a question here usually when we talk about acid we talk about the ph of the fluid will be almost zero so a quick question for the audience when we bump the acid inside the formation and you will bump it initially with the ph is equal to zero when it produces back what will be the ph the expected ph when it's completely consumed does anyone can give any idea just i would like to to see like what's your thoughts about the the flow back ph uh, ph 7 bh that's neutral 14 bh that's alkaline just to, to remind the people the bh numbers so we start with acidizing with here with 0 bh and water neutral is a bh of 7 and if it's alkaline is a bh of 14 so if we start acidizing with a bh here what's what's the expected bh of the return fluid will be does anyone can guess? It will be closer to the water, which is seven, like okay. closer. Yeah. That is perfect. Let's have it as a one answer. Answer number one. Does anyone have anything else? Any other? Okay, so to save the time, that will be true answer, but you forget something here we have a CO2 as a part of the reaction product. And the CO2 will be dissolving in the water that's coming out with the calcium carbonate, make the pH actually slightly less than seven, which will be the, the actual number between four and five. And that's important part that you like to have for, for when you do the, the flow back of the, of the acid. And that's you, when you are Evaluating the acid flow back, you would like to see this BH is coming and to understand how it's, how, how it's been affected. If you have anything in the formation that can BH affecting the corrosion of this one, that's what you need to have. But Okay. So... As we said, like HCL has a lot of uh, advantage. However, it has a lot of disadvantage as well. The first part is the corrosion rate. HCL, as it can react with the formation, it also can react with your pipe system and can corrode your pipe system and the casing and the tubing that you are injecting with. And that can affect the integrity of this uh, tubing. Therefore, we need to use with it a lot of additives like corrosion inhibitor to be sure it will not negatively affecting the integrity of the oil pour. The second part is the reaction rate. HCl is very fast react reaction. I wish I can be able to show to you, but if you put a little bit of HCl with a calcium carbonate, the reaction will take seconds, if, if, if not less than seconds. Immediately, it will react. And as the acid reacts that fast, it makes it difficult for us to be able to place the acid at a higher concentration at deeper of the formation because it will react as long as it will see the calcium carbonate. So from design point of view, we need to, we need to use some retarding agent as well as we need to bump it at really high rate to be able to place the acid deeper inside the formation. Yes, the, the third part is the compatibility with the reservoir and uh, Rock. Uh, from reservoir flow with the oil, HCl can do some sludge and asphaltene. If your oil has asphaltene, we need to put some additives there to be sure that it will not use asphaltene precipitation or cannot use a uh, sludge. Also, if you have some clay content in your carbonate, especially a light or kaolinite, this clay is actually be broken with the HCl. So you need to be sure that is also the amount of clay there can be protected by using some sort of iron control agent or, or some, sort, some sort of a clay inhibitor 
to be sure any sensitive clay inside the formation will not be effective, affected by the HCL and can cause you swelling or fine generation. And the acid is cheap, but as you can see right now, we need to have a lot of additives with the acid that make the package sometimes a little bit expensive. If you have a clay, if you have a sludge, and if you'd like to have a high control, controlled reactivity or controlled reaction rate. So we need to have a lot of additives with this, with this acid. Any question or do you like to go? Just go ahead and, you know, again, if, if there's any question, I will stop you and ask. Okay. The second acid is the hydrofluoric acid, HF, and uh, it's the second inorganic acid that we use in the oil feed industry. We mainly use it when, we, when HCl cannot be used or HCl cannot be dissolved the material. It's the only acid system that can re dissolve silica. That's why we use it mainly for sandstone matrix synthesizing. Because it's the ability to dissolve the silicate. Usually we combine it with HCl just to be sure that we have enough low pH to eliminate any adding, uh, any precipitation and to have a lower pH during the whole treatment. The HF can be used up to 350 Fahrenheit. And from dissolving power, is not as, as HCl when dealing with the carbonate, but can actually dissolve a significant amount of silica. It actually can dissolve up to like one gallon of the 12,3 HCl HF can dissolve up to 0.217 pound of sand. Still high amount, is not as high as HCl with calcium carbonate when we are talking about almost 1.7 for the carbonate case. But still like 0.217 is still high amount of silica to be dissolved. And that is the only acid system that can dissolve silicate. That's therefore when we talk about sandstone acidizing, HF, it needs to come to your mind because that's the only acid that we can use. Dr. Goma, I, I received a question. Uh, what if we use only HF and not a mixture of HF plus HCl? What will happen if we use only HF for, with I'll sandstone? I'll answer this question in a second. Let me look to the reaction product of the H HF. Here I'm having the ability of the HF to to dissolve. If we reacted with a calcium carbonate formation, the reaction product will, will have like, if you have HF plus calcium carbonate, will give you calcium bifluoride plus CO2 plus H2O. Calcium bifluoride is known as a precipitate material. It will precipitate immediately. So if you use HF immediately and react with a calcium carbonate, you will have a damage and you will end up damaging your well. The second part, when HF reacts with the, with the silica, it, it, this reaction it happened is a two step. The first is producing what called flow silic, silic acid, or when it reacts with the, with the dolomite, gives you the same acid, the flow silic acid. And then we have what we call secondary reaction when the flow silic acid reacts with the clay which has a sodium, potassium, or aluminum. And that will be the issue of the second precipitation. You will have a sodium fullosilicate or potassium fullosilicate. And this part is actually will precipitate. Sorry for. The issue of the HF is the reaction product will have a lot of precipitation. However, this precipitation doesn't happen immediately. It happened at pH when the pH start four to six. The reason of using the HCl is HCl will not react with any of these. It will not, it will not react with the silica, it will not react with the bentonite, it will not react with the, any sodium clays or potassium clay or aluminum clay. It will stay in integrity and keep the pH all the time zero. If you have a pH of zero, all this precipitate will not happen because this precipitation only happened when the pH reached to four to six. 
So the importance of HCL, H, HF mixture, HCL work to low to keep the pH low enough to eliminate or prevent any precipitation of the secondary reaction that's happening with HF. I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, so going to the other type of the acid, organic acids. And organic acid, again, it's, we have formic, acetic, and citric. And the, the three is actually, we use them when HCl cannot be used, actually. A lot of time, we need some, some low corrosion rate, and that's happened when we are bumping acid either at a low rate or we, or, we, or, we, or we are expecting the acid will stay in contact with the pipe for a long time then HCl will be a little bit more corrosive to be left inside the tube. Therefore, we are using organic acid in this condition. The advantage is they have a lower corrosion rate. It does not react as much with, uh, with the tubes, so it does not reduce the integrity of the tube. Also, we can easily inhibit them. We can add slightly of corrosion inhibitor, and we can use them in high temperature. Organic acid being used extensively between 250 Fahrenheit up to 350 Fahrenheit without any issue. Again, if we have a high, we use them when we have a high acid by contact time, and that's happened because like sometimes we cannot inject at high rate, so our bumping really low rate and we have a really deep well. In this case, we, we, we recommend to use the organic acid. Or the formation have some sort of a clay that we cannot use and uh, HCl, like in, the, in this case, you cannot also bump uh, HCl, so you bump organic acid. Or the tube itself has some metal that will be dissolved by HCl, like a lot of corrosion, what we called corrosion resistance tubing, which is made of aluminum, magnesium, and chrome. If we bump HCl, you will remove the, the corrosion protection film and will use the integrity of the tube. So in this case, we, we use the organic acid as an alternative to the HCl. Organic acid can be also be used with the HCl as what we call the iron control agent. It helps to control the iron and to keep it out of the solution. So it will not use any issue. So, what typical additives we use with acid stimulation? Before I, I go in, in each one, I would like to highlight acid additives is a very important category. And that's actually the main difference between surface company. So if you like to select between Schlumberger, for example, or Baker Hughes or Halliburton, your selection will be depend on what additives each company can provide to you. The cost and the performance of each chemicals. For example, all the three, all the surface company in the market can easily provide you with HCl and HF. It's a commodity product. So you can actually, even the production, some of the production company can actually buy them directly. However, the main distinguish between the surface company is between the package that they can provide to us. The first, the first major additive is the corrosion inhibitor. It is actually one of the main additives and the must additives when we're using acidizing. You will not find any acid formulation without corrosion inhibitor. You must have a corrosion inhibitor with all your acids additives. And it helps to reduce the corrosion rate. And actually, for each acid, one of the main tests before doing any treatment to do uh, what called corrosion to check corrosion rate. And it needs to be less than 0.05 bound per feet square. So what you do, you get a piece of the, of the tube that you are bumping your acid in, casing or tubing, and soak it similar to the hour of the treatment. So if you are bumping acid for six hours, so you need to soak it in the same acid that you are bumping in six hours at higher, at similar pressure and temperature to the condition of the well bore. 
and check how much weight loss per surface area of the, of the, of the sample that you have. And the value need to be less than 0.05 pound per feet. Do you know, you, you can see like how much thickness we are losing from the tubing for this amount. Can anyone guess how much thickness of the tubing lost by 0.05 pound per square feet? How much thickness at the end of the treatment? Ahmed, does anyone write, say anything? Uh, no. Okay, so it's by the way, by the way, they, they can answer because this is a Zoom meeting. So if they have answers, they can speak. So do. Ah, okay. So thirty-one micron. Actually, that is the amount. So if you have a corrosion that can reduce the thickness of the tubing more than thirty-one micron micrometer you cannot accept this asset. If it's less than 31, it's acceptable. But higher than this amount is not acceptable. So we're talking a bit about a very small reduction in the thickness that you can accept it. And that is, that's why we need a corrosion inhibitor to be sure that is, the acid will not react and reduce any thickness of the tubing that you're bombing the acid in. A second important additive is called corrosion heptor intensifier. And we use the intensifier at a temperature greater than 250 Fahrenheit. It helps the corrosion heptor to stay effectively at a higher temperature. If you see an intensifier being used at a temperature less than 250 Fahrenheit, it means there's something wrong. It smell is one of the additives that needed at when the temperature is too high. So it is one of the additives that use it at a higher temperature to be sure to support or to, uh, to be sure the corrosion inhibitor will work in a more effective way. Iron chelating agent. Iron is one of the things that can actually cause a lot of damage inside the formation. So we'd like to be sure this iron will not be precipitated and be, be, in, be in, in solution. So we use an additive called iron control agent to keep the iron in solution. Other additives, anti-sludge agent, and it's been used when you have an oil well, and the oil that you have, have a lot of asphaltine. To be sure this asphaltine will not be precipitated or causing any damage, we typically use an anti-sludge agent. A second part is solvent. A lot of time we mix the acid with solvent to be sure that if you, if we already having asphaltine issue or wax issue, in this case, the solvent will be able to dissolve both and will not have any damage coming from the organic deposition, asphaltine or wax. The last thing that to improve the uh, reactivity of the acid, we use retarded agent. And this has helped to reduce the reaction rate of HCl by having a polymer or having a surfactant that increases the viscosity of the acid and reduce the corrosion, the reaction rate, allowing the acid to go further inside the formation and be more uh, efficient. So, the uh, the second part is the acid treatment. What, 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 what acid treatment we typically have, we typically do. So we have a different of acid treatments that we typically uh, bump. I will start from beckling the treatment, what's called beckling. Another treatment called soaking, acid breakdown, or matrix oxidizing itself, sandstone or carbonate. And the last one is acid fracturing. So we will go one by one and see which, each, what, the, what does each treatment do and what's the typical acid that we use for each treatment. First one is called beckling treatment. And usually we do this before any acid job. Is the process is pretty simple. We are circulating usually a low acid strength between three to five weight percent HCl. 
And the idea here, we try to remove any iron or any rust in the pipe. So even if the pipe is new, usually you will see some rust inside the pipe. This rust, if you bump your acid and the acid will go through the formation, all this rust will go inside the formation and cause the damage. Therefore, we try to circulate an acid, like three to five percent HCl, to try to make it, to bring it like as a new, or remove all the rust, something to, to the shape. And all this rust will be come out and will not go inside the formation. So simply, you circulate the acid inside the well bore. If you have this treatment called Bickling treatment, usually the acid concentration between three to five weight percent. And mainly you have two types of additive there. Corrosion inhibitor as a must additive with any acid treatment. And we are talking about removing rust, which is mainly iron oxide. So we need to have um, some sort of iron control agent that's also go with it. So usually it's a pretty simple acid, three to five percent HCl with some corrosion inhibitor and some iron control agent. A second treatment, we call, it has a different name. Some people call soaking, some people call agitating, some people call acid watching. Uh, and the idea here or the, uh, the process here is pretty simple. We like to put some acid inside the well bore and we soak it for some time to remove any scale inside the tubing. And I'm not sure if you can see the picture or not. Can you see this one? This is the amount of scale that been deposited with time. So as you are producing calcium carbonate, one of the major scale that will stuck in the tubes and build with time. And you can see it's pretty thickness and can actually reduce the effective diameter of the tubing, reducing your rate. So what you need, you need to inject some acid, soak it, soak it there, leave it there for a certain time, allow it to dissolve this material and to restore your initial diameter. You will be able to remove all the scale. Also, you will be able to remove or open the perforation. Some of the scale also will be stayed in the perforation and plug it. So you will be able to clean the perforation. And if any scale also in the formation phase, it will be removed. Usually, the main additives that go with this acid is a corrosion inhibitor as a must additives. And Depending where you are, if you are mainly soaking the acid inside the tubing, you will keep the corrosion inhibitor only. However, if you are expecting this acid will leak inside the formation, in this case, you need to add additional additives depending on the formation. So you are having a sludge issue, you will have an sludge agent. If you need some solvent, you will add some solvent. If you need iron control agent, you will add iron control agent, depending on what the formation that you will have. Other treatment called acid breakdown job. And in this case, you are mainly try to affect the perforation. Usually when you have a new well and you are perforated with a perforated gun, there will always be a debris inside the, perfor inside the perforation tunnel. So what you would like to do, you will bump some acid, try to remove this debris and increase the effective diameter of the perforation. We call it acid breakdown job or sometimes you call it just a breakdown uh, job. Or, or sometimes the people call it acid spread head, which you bump it in, in front of the frack, try to clean the perforation. Typical additives that use, as usual, corrosion inhibitor. We're here targeting an uh, perforation. So definitely the acid will go inside the formation. Therefore, you need to be sure that you will have the formation compatibility additives with you. So, Whatever additives you need to be sure there is no damage to the formation, you need to add it there. Usually you are not targeting one perforation, you are targeting group of perforation, and therefore you need some sort of diverter agent, some sort of, like if you are treating a certain part of perforation, you need to be sure that you're treating the other parts. You need to divert from the one that cleaned first to the one that will clean later. After that, we can move on to the major uh, acid treatment. Here, the first major one is the sandstone acidizing. 
And as we just said earlier of the presentation, the main asset that's been used in, to dissolve in, in sandstone is the HF acid system. And as we are talking about sandstone acidizing, so we're still talking about matrix acidizing. So we are injecting the acid as a pressure, at a pressure or at a rate less than the fracture pressure. And you can see here, I have like a simple cartoon that show the acid as it's moving and you will have your poor structure or, or, your, or your formation pores. What's happening? The acid will react in the face of the pore and dissolve this part. In sandstone, as you are dissolving this part, you are actually improving the porosity and improving the permeability. You are not creating wormhole as we will see in, in, uh, in carbonate, but you are just actually just enhancing a little bit this one by dissolving the contact between the acid and the mineral phase or the formation phase. The best way to inject sandstone acidizing, usually we do it in a three step. The first step we inject HCl only. And the idea here is just to remove any carbonate. We know when HCF react with the calcium carbonate is, is producing calcium bifluoride and calcium bifluoride will precipitate immediately. Therefore, we'd like to pump HCl first to completely dissolve the carbonate. So when the HF coming later, we'll not see carbonate. We'll see only silica that will be dissolved by the HF. So initially, we bump HCl just to, to dissolve any carbonate that, that, the, that if it's existed when the HF see it, it can cause damage. Then we go with the main acid, which is HCl HF treatment. And the acid will work to, toward the silica and dissolve the silica. Behind it, at the later stage, we'll do overflux with HCl. And the idea here is to keep the pH as low as possible. So you don't have, you cannot reach to the pH 4 to 5, and you don't have any precipitate. When we talk about the HCl, HF, we have different ratio that we can use. Sometimes we don't need to have a really high strength facet. We, we need some, some cold diluted mud acid or some sort of a low strength of the acid. In this case, the HCl will be a concentration less than 7% and the HF will be less than 1.5%. However, the typically what we call regular mud acid or regular concentration, usually between 7.5 and 12% HCl or 1.5 and to 3% HF. And usually it's actually 12.3, 12 HCl and three HF. That's a typical and the most used one. However, in some concentration, we really need the high concentration of HF. In this case, we'll go with the HCL concentration to a higher value, like almost 16% or 6% HF. But we, we, rare, we don't use it that often. We, we use it only if we need the really to dissolve out of silica near world bro area. But typical one is the regular Mud, which is 12.3. That's a typical one that we typically use in the field. A second point is the carbonate acid diving. And, and in this one is a little bit different than the sandstone acid diving. In this case, we are actually creating a wormhole. The reason that we are creating the wormhole because the, the acid that we are using will have a much higher dissolving power. If, if you just remember, like HCl, who attracts with carbonate, it, one gallon will dissolve 1.7 pound. So, and will dissolve it that fast. Therefore, when it reacts, it actually will create the channels inside the formation because of the dissolving power is too high. These channels, we call it wormholes. And depending on how fast we inject the acid, the shape of the wormhole will be actually a change. So I have here the sh different shape of the wormhole as a function of the rate. So that's what we call dominant wormhole when it's really thick. 
let me have it in the second picture. That would be much more easier to understand. So I'm going here from low rate to really high rate. And that will be the shape of the wormhole as we're going. So if you are bumping the acid at a really low rate, you will not have enough acid to go inside the formation. So whatever acid will do, it will react mainly with the surface of the core and you will dissolve the surface of the core. That's what we call at the beginning phase dissolution. Increasing the rate a little bit will allow the acid to go a little bit deeper, but still react more at the surface than deeper. That is will give us like what we call like conic conical shape, like, like a cone shape. However, if you start increasing the acid rate more and more, you start getting what we call dominant wormhole when it's a long pipe inside the formation. So as you are injecting here with a high rate, you can see the wormhole is going pretty deep. Usually you can see still inlet is a little bit small, bigger than deeper inside the frame. Until you reach what we call dominant wormhole or optimum wormhole. The optimum wormhole usually you will see almost has a constant diameter through the section and it will take the minimum amount of the acid to reach to the deeper area. When you increase the, the rate further more than the dominant wormhole or the optimum wormhole, you will start seeing a branching effect. As you are bumping, the acid will move in this direction, deeper direction, as well as it will leak at the side, create a lot of branching. So depending on the rate, the branching intensity will increase. The higher rate, you will have a more higher branching out of the side. Usually at our design, we like to design targeting this one. So in the lab, we get a core, actual core from the field, and we get several cores and we run different rates. And we see which rate is give us the optimum wormhole, and we try to design our injection rate in the field close to this optimum rate to be able to get an optimum wormhole diameter in the field. That will help us to reduce the minimum of the acid that we'll use and get the maximum benefit of the acid in the field. The last treatment that I will try to cover is the acid fracturing. And here we are bumping the acid at higher pressure, more than the more than fracture pressure. So what will be happened, we will create an actual frac. So if you bump it, you'll, you'll see like, I have here like, this is a sort of the frac that being created with acid. You are not anymore bumping acid in another direction. What's happening as you, soon as you create the frac, all the acid will go toward the fracture. What the acid will do, the acid will start to react with the fracture's face, create uneven pattern. So when you close, the, the uneven pattern will create a permeability that is big enough to have the flow through it. So let me have it this one. So what's happened? You have here a, a fracture face. And you have an acid that creates actually a long pore structure through it. So when the two, two pieces of the frac is closed, you can see you have a still big area that the, flow, the acid would be flow. And that is what we call good etching or good channel development. However, sometimes you did not create this big one. You create actually a small one that is insufficient and that is mean that you did not bump enough acid or you did not distribute it well that is happening by creating a small area with time it will be closed as you are closing having a higher closure pressure on the side dr goma i received a second question uh, someone asking how are inhibitors different from retarder uh, inhibitors is used to in where well, I, I believe you are talking about corrosion inhibitor and retarded inhibitor yes. is actually creating a layer in the tubing okay let me have it as a 
go back a little bit here. Okay, maybe I will delete this one. Okay. So corrosion inhibitor, if you have your tubing here, usually corrosion inhibitor create a layer at the at the tube, a protection layer on the tube. This layer eliminates the acid to the views on the surface of the tube and protect it. That is a corrosion inhibitor, how it do exactly. Retard it is actually increase the viscosity of the acid itself. Make it a little bit more viscous, so the movement of the acid itself will be much less. So corrosion inhibitor, by definition, just create, absorb it. It works only in the tubes, and it all, what it does, it just build a, a protective layer film on the tube surface. However, retarded is work actually in the viscosity parameter. It makes the viscosity of the acid going from one centiboise to several hundred of, of centiboise. So it has a higher viscosity, the acid will not move that easy, and it, it will not react that easy as well. Okay. Any other question? No, you, you can go ahead. Okay. The other side of, of, of the acid fracturing, if you bump too much acid, and actually you itch all the surface. And if you over, over itching it, what will be happened? You, you, you will end again with, with similar condition like insufficient itching. When it's closed, the, you're creating too many opening area that when the, the two pieces of the frack is closing to each other, you will, it will end us with a very poor conductivity. And the amount of the conductivity that you will have is much less. So in the acid fracture, you would like to be able to, to be sure that you will have enough acid distribution to create a good etching without bumping less acid to have a very minimum etching or bumping too much acid that can actually dissolve everything. And when you close, you will not have this uh, ununiform pattern good. So the, the best way to do the acid fracturing we do it in a three different step. The first one, we bump a cross-linked bed and to create the frack. So you, first thing, you create the frack. And the size of the bed is depending on how the geometry of the frack you have. If you like to have a larger frack, in this case, you bump a cross-linked bed, a big one. If you just need to have a small frack, it's, you will bump a small bed size. So the bed size is definitely give you the fracture geometry that you are targeting. Then after you create the frack, you bump your acid system. And usually use 15 to 20% HCl. If the temperature is too high, like above 200, 250 to 300 Fahrenheit, in this case, sometimes we use acetic and formic acid as, a, as an acid for, for the acid fraction. However, majority of the time is just between 15 to 20% to 28 HCl. Then after the HCl, you go with a, with a flush. And the idea here to be sure that you don't leave any acid inside the tubing, just all the acid being bumped to the formation. So if you do this, that is a typical step, three steps you do for acid fraction. The final part of the presentation is acid placement, which is happening how can you just be able to be distributed the acid through the well bore? So acid is known as a reactive fluid and as it's bumping inside the formation, it will increase the permeability of the formation. So imagine if I'm having a well bore like I have in this cartoon and I'm actually bumping acid. As like any fluid, it will go 
first to the hypermobility formation. So imagine I'm having here three type of layer, like real, really high permeability, one medium permeability, and the top layer is a low permeability. So I will see this high, this is medium, and this is low permeability. When you pump the acid, what will go, what will be happen? Usually acid will go initially to the area with the hypermobility, and as the acid go in this hypermobility, it will enhance the porosity and will make it a higher permeability. So what will be happening, acid will keep going in this zone. It will not go to the medium or the low permeability. Because simply, like any, any water inject, would like to go to the least resistance flow. So with this concept, acid will not touch the medium permeability or the low permeability zone. And you will end only with stimulating one zone out of three. And if you have four or five or six, that's what will be happening. It ends up simulating one or two out of multiple zones that you are targeting. Therefore, we need to have what we call acid diversion technique or another technique that can help you to have this type of diversion. So I will pause this one right now. So the placement technique that we have, we have either mechanical or chemical technique. Mechanical is example we have cold tubing, Bakker, Bridge Plug, and Borsiers. Or chemical techniques, we have foamed acid, emulsified acid, gelled acid, and in situ gelled acid. Just to go one by one like mechanical, we have cold tubing. And in this case, we are actually using a cold tubing to spot the acid at each location. So in this case, you are guaranteed that your each zone take, uh, take the acid. So you are bumping using the cold tubing, the acid at each zone. Another one, use buckers. So simulate a zone, then put a buckers, simulate another zone, then put another buckers, simulate a third zone, you, and you put a certain buckers. So you, you use a bucker to isolate the zone that you are trying to inject. So inject and then close, go another to another area, inject, and then close. So using a buckler, multiple buckers to be able to distribute the acid through the whole zone. Similar to the buckler is a bridge plugging. The same, simulate a certain zone and then add a plug and move on. Simulate the zone that you like to have and then add another plug. And at the end of the treatment, drill all this plug that you are having. Final mechanical one is actually bolt sealers. In this case, you, if the acid will go in the hypermobility zone, bump some sort of a ball material that will sit in the perforation and close this perforation. So in this case, you are not having buckers or having cold tubing. You can bump something from the surface that can actually plug each perforation. We call it bolt sealers. This mechanical method is actually uh, is the best method to be sure that we have a good distribution. It's all of it. You can be sure that when you use when you are using mechanical, you are pretty sure that you have a good placement and you you are hundred percent sure the acid been evenly distributed or distributed in the way that you like to have. However, it usually need. Uh, uh, cement certain type of completion. You need to have casing and cemented most of the types. It's, if you have open hole completion, a lot of this mechanical method does not work very, very good. It controls the fluid only inside the well bore. When it goes to the formation, you don't have any control. It may actually bypass behind the casing and you cannot, you cannot be sure that the, the acid will actually, will, will go to the zone, the target zone. It may actually go to another zone. Third and most important, it's expensive. It's a pretty expensive to use. Imagine using for each zone that you are targeting a bridge plug or a buckler, that's a pretty expensive. And then after that, you need a, drag, a drilling rig to, or workover rig to drill all these plugs and remove it after the treatment. It also make it a little bit costly. So mechanical method is, is, is good working. It's, it's a good isolation, however, it had a lot of disadvantage, and the main one 
will be the expensive, the cost. The cost will be extremely high. Uh, again, we have a bolt sealers, which is still a part of the mechanical. It works only if you have a perforated well. You need to have a perforated casing and uh, cemented. Also, it needs a high bumping rate. If you are bumping at a low rate, it will not work. And designing how many bolts you need to run is, is, is a, a little bit like uh, critical. And not, not all the time is, is being designed right. And you may actually plug a formation that you need actually to treat it. So still a little bit tough to deal. Therefore, we like to, to use a chemical method for acid placement. First, chemical method will work on all completion type. So it, it, it doesn't limit you to any completion. The way that all these chemical methods work in the viscosity. So what you do is just increase the viscosity of the reservoir fluid. You, you, you increase the viscosity of the acid more than any fluid in the reservoir. So it, it, it help, it help, it help, it help, it help you having good sweep efficiency and a good distribution. All this chemical, all this chemical transform the fluid to be a non-Newtonian shear sinking behavior. So when you bump it at higher rate, it will have a low viscosity, but as it's going inside the formation, it will have a really high viscosity. It, it helps you control the fluid inside the formation and also give you a good retardation. It, it, the wormholing will be much efficient using this chemical method. So mainly we have a tool for the, for the chemical method that the most the most used two things right now is, is in situ gel acid based on polymer and based on surfactant. And the polymer one is, is not used as, as well, but however, the most recent one is a surfactant and been used extensively in the field currently. Some people call themselves diverting acid or viscosity control acid, but it's the same name or the same behavior. So the idea here is working with the pH. At a low pH, the acid will have a low viscosity. And when the pH is reach around two, the actually the polymer will be cross-linked and initiated a really high viscosity. And at that region, you will have a really high uh, diversion power. As soon as the pH go to above four, it will be completely broken and you will not have any damage or any concern during the flowback. And the way that it works in the field, you are bumping the acid. Again, it will go through the high permeability formation. However, inside the high permeability formation, when the pH increased to two, the, the gel will be formed using a really high viscosity plug. It will plug the high permeability zone, making the next acid to go to the lower permeability. And as it's going through the lower permeability, it will start from pH zero. As it reacts, the pH will increase to around, again, two, the fluid viscosity will increase, blogging the medium, forcing the acid to go to the lower permeability. In this case, using just one fluid, you will be able to place the acid through the whole job. And at the end of the treatment, when the pH increased to around four, all this high viscosity will be completely broken and flow back and you treat it the whole section without any issues. Actually, that was my last slide today. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Guys, please, if you, if you have any question, you can go ahead and ask. Any question before we finish? Okay, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, thank you very much for the informative uh, session. And for sure, we, uh, we wish to have you again uh, in the future. Thank you.